back out by Jamie Baker. Yuskevich wheels it back in. Lindros lost. Archibald takes him out of the play. Up with it is Recky. Walks in front. Shot one. Knocked down. Rebound. Score! Lindros! SportsNetwork.com and Wildfire Radio present the OMB Podcast, episode number 54. We're going to look at the Flyers unvarnished. And I'm here with my partners, uh, Chef B. How are you, man? Good. Last day of vacation. Can't think of a better way to spend it talking hockey with my guys here. Excellent. And also with us from Brotherly Pod, Brotherly Puck, National Pod, National Puck, a busy man still, even in the summer. Uh, Dan, a Flyer fan. I am having a midlife crisis. <laughs> well, I hope you live longer than that. I'm going to be 25 on Monday. Oh. Wow. I think I should start picking oh, out a retirement home. Well, we, well, first thing you got to do is you got to get a cemetery plot. But we'll talk about that later. Damn, midlife <laughs> crisis. You should, you should get my PSA test result I got today. Uh-oh. Uh, and also from the fourth period dot com, uh, Anthony DeMarco. Hey guys, what's going on? Yeah, now did you you get your note from the uh, for the teacher for being absent last time? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's constant. It's currently being processed, but you know, uh, I was up uh, wild hunting goose chase in uh, Ontario a couple. Uh, what was that? A month ago, you guys did that. Three weeks. Three weeks. Three weeks. Yeah. Yeah, I was on vacation, and I couldn't, uh, I couldn't convince the wife to uh, sneak off to a place with Wi-Fi to let me do it. Yeah, that's okay. I, I, I've heard that you're never tardy to the party, but we'll, uh, we'll, we'll let you go on that one. But no, always great to have you. We got the full crew here tonight. And before we do indeed look at the Flyers unvarnished and explain what that is all about, let's give you some updates about the Flyers the latest RFA news. Uh, Jason Martinez from 97.5 and the Stick to Hockey podcast has tweeted out, as many have seen, that uh, someone in the know has told him that Travis Konechny is expected to be getting close, real close, to a bridge deal, two to three years, around four and a half AAV. However, uh, Ivan Provorov is kind of log-jammed with guys like Wierenski, Matthew Kachuk, and uh, Marner, which might be the worst uh, example of what's going on in, in the NHL with the RFAs. And further from the Athletic, uh, Provy was talking about a six-year deal, but that's subject to change, and nothing's moving. In fact, one agent in that article said, wake me up after Labor Day. Somebody's going to pull the trigger, and here we go. And I think it's, it's going to be like that. And let me start with you, Dan. You know, it's uh, it's kind of frustrating, but there's going to be some late movement with these RFAs, and the rosters are going to be affected later than usual. Yeah, there's quite a few players holding out right now, and, uh, you know, it's all waiting for somebody to bite first, and it's just not happening. But uh, going back to the Travis Connecting news, that one is, that one's a bit worrisome, in my opinion. Uh, you know, in two years from now, you got Carter Hart, you got Travis Sanheim, and the expansion draft that summer. And if you wait for three years, and that's the year that Giroux and Couturier need contracts. So I think Connecting would probably be best served on more of a Gostas Beer type contract, you know, try and get him for as little money as long term as you can. But uh, I'm not a big fan of these bridge deals. And the fact that they already have Sanheim on one, you know, is just delaying the inevitable there because you're already going to have to pay Provorov this summer. So 
given the couple contracts they've come on up over the next few years, you know, Myers, uh, Myers, uh, what's his name, Patrick, and Lin, uh, Lindblom next summer. So right. Lots of money to be had here over the next few years for the Flyers, and I think that probably locking up some of these guys longer term would be the better way to go. It would seem that way, but then you have a, a contract ever since, uh, what did people say? It was uh, Anthony, let, let me get with you. Was it the dry sidle contract that kind of changed things, or was there another contract? And people are looking at these and say, listen, if we're going to go longer, I, I want really big money. And with Travis Konechny, he's he doesn't have a complete game yet. I think they want to see more out of him. Yeah, well, the dry sidle one was kind of like one of those the one of the first big second tier contracts at the time it seemed like a vast overpayment, but obviously it's aged very well in Edmonton and it's one of Chiarelli's few bright spots. But yeah, you know, Konechny is a guy that you know he's been a bit inconsistent. He's had flashes of being a bona fide top six type sniper player, but I, I think that Dan is on to something there. I think you're kind of playing with fire if you go two to three years with a guy like Travis Konechny. He's already shown that he's a proven 20 25 goal scorer and uh i think that as he gets up there with age his game will only improve uh, i was of the of the belief that they were going to go somewhere around four times four i know that the the uh, contracts of andreas Janssen and casperi Kapanen up here in canada of the maple leaves kind of set the bar for connectney obviously connectney is a bit uh worth a bit more than those guys but uh yeah i guess what mertennis has a no in there around the situation but yeah i'm with dan here i just think that uh although it may seem all right right now and the flyers may not want to get locked in too long with connect me while fully not knowing what kind of player he is he's a guy that is looking like he's gonna be trending upward and in three years from now he may kind of have the handcuff uh, the flyers handcuffed over a barrel that could be the case you know chef uh, when you think about it is Travis Konechny that much less of a gamble or more of a gamble than somebody like Nolan Patrick, who hasn't delivered the kind of offensive production that they have had so far with Konechny, and particularly with his uh, five-on-five scoring? Yeah, I think I think at this point, uh, Patrick is more of a gamble because he hasn't blossomed being the higher pick that he has. But I, I think all this, we're still a year or two out. I think from seeing Patrick develop into what Patrick is going to be. Uh, but Konecki, I would love to see more, a better defense uh, out of him. And if it is a bridge deal, I'm like, Dan, I'm not too upset about it. Uh, because l- like you had stated earlier, I, I don't think he's, he, he's the complete package yet. I don't think he's, he's gotten to the point where he, he, he has an all around game yet or, or that's all he's going to be. I mean, so from that point, I'm going to just stay there. Okay. You know, the one thing, when if you talk about a, a comparable like uh, Kasperi Kapanen, I would definitely say that TK has a higher offensive ceiling. But in terms of a well-rounded game, right now, and again, emphasizing right now, Kapanen is a better all-around player. You could put him in more spots and trust him at different junctures of the game. And he definitely would be a favorite of the coach to put out, especially when you look at some of the really egregious turnovers that, that Konechny has, uh, has given away. So we'll have to see how that turns out. Uh, look, I like the player and he's got a snarl that the yeah. Flyers really, really lack. And yeah. that's one of the things we talk a little bit about some of the um, some of the uh, prognostications by national uh, outlets uh, that are people people are underestimating about Kevin Hayes. He also is a tough guy to play against, and that element with Konechny and Hayes and a few other guys on the Flyers is, is definitely welcome. But gents, I wanted to get to the main course tonight. We're gonna, you know, we're not gonna forget about Frank Saravalli and. And the prospect uh, the rankings that came out and, and the predictions, national predictions. And uh, we got some good stuff for you, so hang in there. But I think, you know, Chef and I started this thing a, a couple of years ago, just about two years ago today almost. And when we started out, we talked about our experience 
in discovering hockey, the NHL, the Flyers, and kind of gave a little background. And I think we, we have a, a unique podcast here at OMB because we have people who've been here listening and watching the Flyers for 50 years, like myself. And then, you know, we have somebody like Chef, was about 35 years or so? Yeah, 81, 82, I guess I started really getting into it. Oh, uh, okay. So you're not far behind me. Uh, and, no. you know, then and, and Dan and Anthony, uh, somewhat younger, but maybe not as nostalgic for some of the things that happened in the, in, in the past. And that can give them a very fresh perspective. So, Anthony, I want to begin with you. You obviously are not like the three of us that are, you know, born and raised in the Philadelphia metro area up there in Canada. Uh, were you a Canadian fan? And how did you get to uh, be involved with the Flyers? Was that, was that strictly through TFP? Or well, why don't you give us a little rundown on that? Well, like Dan, I'm uh, 25 years old, so I really only started watching hockey just from a pure spectator point of view when I was about, uh, I would say, five, six years old. So my first memory of the Flyers was the uh, 2000 Eastern Conference Final against the New Jersey Devils. How I became a Flyers fan is my dad was a crazy fan. You know, I remember when I first started watching hockey, like, I liked uh, Paul Correa and the Anaheim Mighty Ducks, and he was just like, absolutely not. You're going to like the Flyers. So, yeah, I just kind of, so he just kind of made me um, go down that avenue, uh, whether I liked it or not. And then I grew up in the, you know, that last two, year or two of Eric Lindros, and then my favorite player growing up was always John the Player. I had one of those... Um, classic orange uh, 1990, uh, 1990s Flyers jerseys with LeClaire on it, number 10. So, yeah, that's how I just kind of started. And then uh, as I got older, I got more into it, and I fell in love with players like Simon Gagné and uh, Eric Desjardins and, you know, what have you. And then here we are almost 20 years later. Wow. What, was your father a big fan of Moose DuPont? Uh, no, he really liked uh, Bobby Clark. He he just liked those uh, old school players. Believe it or not, like my father, uh, he always went against the uh, Quebec born players. I don't know what it was. I think he was just confrontational and wanted to get people around him always riled up. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I think he'd be looking out for him or Simone Nole, but Bob Clark is, is certainly, he is uh, Mr. Flyer. And um, so then you started with the. Uh, TFP, how, how long ago was that? So I started with TFP about two years ago. Yeah, so I started right after Labor Day in 2017. So I'll give you a bit, just a bit more of a background. I really started following the Flyers, kind of like a writer like I do now, in I would say 2006. So right in time for that miserable season where they got 56 points. And I think that's when I started reading things like, okay, how are they going to make this team better? And I remember, ironically enough, pulling up the fourth period, and it was just like, oh, Flyers, will make play for Danny Breer, Chris Drury, and Scott Gomez. And then we had that crazy summer of 2007. Yeah. And then pretty much from then on out, like, I knew, like, I was in love with the team, and I wanted it to be more than just fanfare. I wanted to cover it. I wanted to understand the team, how they could make the team better inside and out. I remember the 2008 uh, season very, very well when they beat Washington off Joffrey Loophole's overtime goal in Game 7 when Martin Biro and R.J. Umberger helped them carry him to a five-game series win over the Montreal Canadiens. And then they got bounced by the Pittsburgh Penguins and whatnot. So I started writing kind of sporadically on Broad Street Hockey in the summer of 2010. And I remember I started writing on Broad Street Hockey just as a fan. Or they had this thing called Fan Post because I was livid that Paul Holmgren was trading Simon Gagne and not Jeff Carter. And that's how I really started writing because I was so against the idea of trading Simon Gagne. And for some reason, I just I wanted Carter gone. And maybe we could get into that a bit later because I, I remember the reason why now that I bring it up. And then I just started writing, and as I went through college, I got into contact with Dennis Bernstein, and uh, I started, like I said, two years ago, and uh, here we are. Fantastic. Well, well, why don't you share about about Carter? Um, you know, obviously he did get traded, 
And I didn't want him traded at that time personally. I was kind of seeing Giroux as a replacement for Richards and let's go get a defenseman. But what, what was your thinking uh, about trading Carter at that juncture? So bear in mind, I, I was 16 at the time. So this was coming off of the 2010 Stanley Cup final loss to the Blackhawks. And in that series, I think it was fair to say the Flyers were lacking third-pairing defensemen and an adequate starting goaltender. So the Flyers were in a cap crunch because they traded for Andre Mazaros and then signed uh, Sean O'Donnell. And I remember that it came out like, okay, well, the Flyers have a surplus of high-impact forwards on big contracts, and Simon Gagne was on his way out. And I always just remember there was just so many reasons. For one, you know, you had, you were set down the middle. You had Richards, Briere, Giroux as the one, two, three punch. Carter finished those playoffs on the wing with Gagne and Richards. Right. That's number one. Number two was the fact that Carter was due a new contract that year, as was Simon Gagne. Carter was going to need a, a salary increase. Gagne was probably going to go downwards, which he did. So I thought long-term cap reasons, it would just be smart to keep Simon Gagne. Number three was, and this was the big one for me, was because I remember at that time, and this is when I really got into like the rumors of hockey and I started understanding like how trades work, is that the Flyers had had repeated discussions with the Los Angeles Kings about one of Jonathan Quick or Jonathan Bernier, and that the rumor deal was one or the other plus Wayne Simmons, for Jeff Carter, and that would have solved a lot. You would have gotten a young Wayne Simmons for depth and a guy like Bernier, who at the time was the most highly, highly touted goaltending prospect in the NHL, or Jonathan Quick. But instead of trading Jeff Carter because Holmgren refused to do so, they dumped Simon Gagne for a bag of pucks named Matt Walker, who probably played, what, nine total NHL games. Oh, God. So I kind of I resented the fact that Gagne was still coming off of a good season with the Flyers and was still a productive player at the time. So they traded Gagne and dumped them for nothing, as opposed to if they would have traded Carter, they could have gotten significant value back. So there there was never a point that I was saying, well, Gagne is more valuable than Carter. It was actually on quite the contrary, where I thought they don't need Jeff Carter and they could get significant value for him, especially given the fact that he's going to want more money in the coming years, which he got on that massive 12 year contract. So yeah, those were my reasons for wanting Jeff Carter gone a year before he was eventually traded. Matt yeah, Walker I, I, played, I love, uh, yeah, I love games. that stuff. Yeah. Matt, Matt Walker played eight games for the Flyers and 44 for the Phantoms. But he was right-handed. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I remember, I remember Paul Holmgren that uh, I was so mad at this. He said... Well, we got him because we could see him on the second power play unit. Oh, God. Oh, this is when, Ooh. this is like peak Holmgren stink. Ooh. This is when he was really, uh, he had run out of ideas. And then, of course, Pronger got hurt. And that was a whole other story. But, yeah, now I love this stuff where, where you just, you get out this, uh, what you were thinking at the time, that your frustrations and all that. But the peak, of course, had to be for you. Had to be the 2010 uh, Cup run. Oh yeah, that that was the peak. Like I think there's no words to say because before that, I would say the peak was the, and I was still a bit young at the time, so I struggled to remember. But the peak was the Simon Gagne overtime winner against Tampa Bay in Game Six in the 2004 Eastern Conference Finals. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That that was the peak before then. So let's just lead up to some of the peaks leading up to the uh, Stanley Cup final in 2010. I remember um, there was, I think it was game one versus the Buffalo Sabres in the 2006 playoffs where it went to double overtime. That game was very memorable. Uh, I remember Danny Greer scored in double overtime. And then obviously 2007, they were just an atrocity. But I, I also remember games like the 2008 like playoff run. I was I found really entertaining. They had a very long, hard fought series against Washington. There was another double overtime game there. I think it was game three or four where Mike Knubel scored in double OT uh, on Cristobal Buet. 
And then the Montreal Canadiens, they pretty much just steamrolled over them. Like I said, R.J. Umber got like eight goals in uh, in five games, and Martin B. Roll showed flashes of, uh, I don't know, Carey Price. But, uh, yeah, and then you lead into the 2010 Cup run, and I, and I remember watching game four against Boston with my dad. And I just said, I just don't want them to get swept. Right. It was right. Friday night, and I, he had just picked me up from school, and we were watching at my grandmother's house, and I'm just like, I just don't want them to get swept. And then Simon Gagne, probably another reason why I didn't want them to, because he scored arguably my, my favorite goal of all time in overtime. But, uh, yeah, we know what that series was. And then it was amazing for me, because then they absolutely steamrolled Montreal. And I got to go into my high school parading around like, uh, you know, like Superman in there, you know, laughing at everyone. And everyone was saying, like, I was public enemy number one. So having the Flyers just completely steamroll the Habs was, made it even more sweet. But, uh, yeah, the, uh, the that cup final was, I'm literally getting goosebumps right now. It was, like, the most memorable thing of my hockey uh, memory. But at the same time, it was also very crushing. Yeah, yeah, it's tough to lose. It, it, they lost to a better team, though. I, I, I was uh, corresponding with somebody that it, people say 1975, but they went to six finals since then. Almost every decade they went, and every time they lost, they lost to a dynasty team relative to their era. So, you know, they, but the Flyers have been a good team for a very, very long time. So, uh, so Dan, uh, what what about you? What, what's your personal experience, and uh, to get you where you're at right now? Well, my parents were huge Flyers fans, and and there was Legion of Doom stuff everywhere growing up. And uh, I think my earliest kind of memory, as far as Flyers go, is probably like 2001, 2002. Uh, Keith Primo, John LeClaire, Eric Desjardins, you know, those were kind of my three favorites. And then a couple years later, Robert S. showed up, and uh, he was really my favorite. I was kind of drawn to the Carolina Hurricanes for a while. I was a big Eric Stahl fan growing up. Uh, I'm not entirely sure why, but uh, I, I kind of liked them. But being around the Flyers so often, you know, I, I kind of was forced, essentially, to, to be a fan of theirs. You know, I, uh, New Jersey Devils were also there. I was a big Marty Bardor fan, probably my favorite player of all time sorry everybody but no, he was okay. and uh, Vince LeCalvier was another one that was up there as a kid watching him play and um yeah I just I was kind of a fan for a long time and what's funny is I actually faded out for a while around the cup run uh 2008 to 2011 I kind of didn't watch a lot of hockey I watched the cup run just because they were you know they were in there and doing it but for the most part I wasn't following the team nearly as closely uh at that point and it was the 2011 2012 season I kind of got back into it and then they had that wild uh playoffs with the penguins that year and that was kind of what rehooked me as a fan and uh I've been living this hell ever since so <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, it, 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 it's been a bit of a hell. There's no question about that. It's, uh, it's been interesting. I mean, they've been a tease. Sometimes you thought they were on their way. But in our heart of hearts, I think we've known since 2012 that something's been amiss and that they've needed a, some critical elements. As we head into this season, you know, it, it'll be very interesting to see if they've added uh, – you know, if, if we were now at the end of the beginning of the comeback, we're certainly not at the beginning of a cup run. I, I, I think we probably all agree with that. But you, uh, along the way, uh, decided to write and podcast and do all kinds of stuff. Why don't we get a little background on that? And you can, uh, you can mention the enemy if you want. If you, if you don't want to, it's okay. Not, uh, yeah. not, not our enemy. Don't get me wrong, but your enemy. <laughs> My personal enemy, yeah. Yes. Well, they're not going to get any credit from me here. But uh, I started writing <laughs> columns every once in a while for a site called FastPhillySports.com, which I'm not even entirely sure if they're still around. But uh, I was writing for them, and then a fellow who uh, was starting up a site that I'm not going to name on this program um, asked me if I wanted to contribute. So I did and kind of found a passion for it. They had a couple of guys at the time, uh, our friends Wes Herman, Dan Silver, who um, – were editing a lot of my work and I learned a lot from them along the way and they kind of 
made it easier for me to transition into this as kind of a full-time gig and and it was great i was there for uh, almost two years and then i parted ways and started brotherly puck uh was a pretty big success started the podcast brotherly pod and then uh recently over Towards the end of the season, I started a National Puck and National Podcast Network, which focuses on more of the uh, national level of the NHL rather than just the Flyers. Very good. And that site, Dan doesn't want to mention it, rhymes with Frilly is drier. So, <laughs> <laughs> wow. I'll, I'll let you figure that out. It's, it's, it's cryptic. I know. It's like Rubik's Cube in oral form. Uh, Chef, um, you <gasps> talked a little bit about that. what's that? <laughs> How the hell do I follow that? It's like a, it's like the Sunday jumble in the newspaper. <laughs> Nobody can figure it out. I mean, people are going to be stumped for, for days. I'm going to get requests. This is going to be the highest rated show ever because I'm going to hold out until people guess it. But <laughs> yeah, so so chef, uh, we t- had a conversation similar to this about two years ago, and heck, we got a hell of a lot more listeners than we yeah. had back then. I, I'd like to say right here, right now, thank you so much, all the people who are listening to us now, who've been with us from the beginning. We really appreciate it. And like our buddy Jamie Baskow often, often says from PSN, we wouldn't be here without you. Without you, it's just simply not possible. Thank you. We're going to keep trying to deliver the best show we can with the kind of unique perspective that you get with O and B. And with that chef, uh, give us your rundown. Oh, you know what? You're going to laugh because my growing up, my dad was a baseball fan. So we went to a lot of Phillies games at the vet, you know, doing all, we did the whole family thing. You brought your own stuff. You could bring your own snacks in and way back and you'd get the general admission tickets and then after the fifth inning we'd sneak down when they opened up the fences because the Phillies you thought the Flyers were bad the Phillies really stoinked it up back then in this <laughs> so when I was a kid so I guess like my mom was the big Flyers fan in the house and how how cool was that I mean she had the, she, she loved the Watson the Watson boys and she liked the whole Broad Street Bullies thing and you know, up until I, I can't remember what year it was, but remember, you, you're old enough to remember, Isaiah. I think it was on either they were on 40, 48 or 17 48. for a while. 48, right? And then uh, Prism came out in like 75, but the Flyers weren't on there right away. They didn't get there until like 1984, 85. I remember we got Prism because my mom wanted to watch the Flyers because they were getting good and they had made the playoffs and whatever it was. And then the next year they went to the cup and it was against the Oilers and, you know, wow. Talk about a great series. I remember this, you know, Hexall made some unbelievable stay saves, not so much a great GM, but a great goalie, especially in his prime like that. And, uh, we stoned, uh, Gretzky. And then he came off. Uh, it was a turnover at the blue line. It was like, I can't remember who the hell the players were, but all I know is he stoned one, and as the puck went over, he kind of just flopped on his back, I think, and got like uh, like his right hand out there, and it just stopped the puck on the open net. So I mean, like that—that's kind of what what lit the you know the hockey bug under me was my mom. I thought that was great. She, she you could hear her in the back going, "Hit him, hit him!" <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> so now. I forgot one question. I forgot to ask it. Anybody here play hockey, street hockey, oh, yeah. ice hockey? Street you, ice. Yeah. Okay, so you you Dan, you were a goalie or? Yeah, I was a goalie. I was a huge Robert Esch fan and wanted to be and just like him and Marty Brodeur as well. And I played for a while. Played from fifth grade to sophomore in high school, and then I screwed my knee up and and couldn't get back out there. So I was what ten. What is that? Five? Uh, yeah, probably, almost probably a decade played for a while there. So, cool. Well, and- pretty much just foot hockey for me. Played in like the, the leagues in Northeast Philly, Woodhaven, Thunderbird, and uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. I, I, I can skate, I just can't stop. So I'm a danger to myself and small children. So not the best thing to put me on. It's something I can't stop on. <laughs> No, nah, you can you you're 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 kind of a robust guy, not the tallest guy, but yeah, and out of control Zamboni. 
Yeah, so so what, if there was a highlight for you with, with the Flyers, uh, even if it's not, it may be something that Dan and Anthony uh, haven't heard or haven't mentioned. Sometimes it's the, the youngest memories that, that stick with you. I'm going to go with this. A big one was Cotman and Frankfurt. After I think we clinched the cup in, in the, when we went. Cleared the playoffs were crazy. Like uh, in 2010, we just get in. And then just going down, like, not. I don't even think I went down there because I was smart enough not to go down there. I lived like eight blocks away, and I'm like, I'm not going away. Uh, when, I, when the Flyers actually won in 75 and 70, you know, way back when, uh, that place turned into like this this mecca. Oh yeah, and like, all the fans in Northeast Philadelphia showed up there and were just partying it out. So anytime something happens in Philadelphia now, that place becomes like the mecca where everybody goes to and parties their ass off. You know, and it's it's a and, you know last couple of times it's been awesome because I mean. The police are there, but they actually they, they show a lot of respect. A lot of the fans showed a lot of respect. There weren't too many uh, fisticuffs or any any problems there, so it was kind of awesome. And I, I think that's what I remember mostly, because every time somebody won something in Philly, you were like, "I wonder what Cotman and Frankfurt looks like right now." Yeah, I mean that that, that started with the Flyers in '74. That yeah, really because and and it kind of takes me back. That because this city had won an NBA title in 67 with the Sixers, but it was like so divorced from everything else because Wilt was supposed to be part owner of the team and he got traded. They had it. He was gone. So it's almost like it was like a one year flash with the greatest player in basketball history up to that point in time. And he was gone and I missed it. I started watching hockey and, in 69 right right about the time I was nine years old before and I the first game I actually remember was watching on a UHF channel probably channel 48 with the rabbit ear antennas back in the day the yeah. the Flyers and Montreal uh December 27th I looked it up I, I didn't remember exactly when but it was December 27th 1969 a 2-2 tie versus the Canadians and it was the first tour of duty for Bernie Perrant at Rogi Vashon uh, in, you know, at the Montreal Forum for the defending champion Canadians. And, you know, I knew about football, I knew about baseball, but the idea that there would be a tie in a major league sport, it was, it was crazy. But I think it was Gene Hart that was the one that said, this is a very good uh, thing for the Flyers to get a tie in Montreal considering they're only a two- or three-year-old team. Yeah, I guess they're in the midst of their third season, 69-70. So, so uh, yeah, I mean, that's you know, my first memory of watching the Flyers. And I think they're on Channel 6 sometimes. It, it obviously is still an ABC affiliate. And they used to wear the um, – and this is a big deal, Anthony, in Canada. Are there still purists that like the home teams to wear the whites – at home, and then wear the like the the fancy fancier uniforms on the road. That used to be a big deal. It's funny you talk about that because today on the TSN local radio in Montreal, they were talking about why they made that switch, and it was because that the white jerseys weren't selling outside of the local team's market. So they started making the road teams wear the white jerseys so that they could be showcased um, in other cities in the NHL. Um, I, I, I don't think that there's so many people that are tr still stuck in that tradition. I know like maybe a, a guy like my dad has said sometimes that he preferred it. But I've always <clears throat> excuse me, I've always been of the belief that I'd like the more colorful and you know home jerseys to, you know to represent the team. But uh, I always found it weird growing up why the white jerseys were the home ones. And then when they switched, I believe it was during the 05 lockout after that where they switched. But uh, no, I, I don't run into too many people who uh, still are stuck in the past in terms of uh, the home and the white jerseys. Well, I knew it had to be sales. I think it happened a lot, actually, a little bit before that, maybe well before that. But 
Uh, I, I honestly, I, I really forget, but I do prefer the Whites at home. And I like seeing, it, you know, seeing the team, the, the visiting team, it gives them a little more flair, I guess. I don't know. But um, it, it has a lot to do not only with sales. It's just everything, there's so much exposure. It's no big deal either way. If they think they're going to get more jersey sales, every, all these games are televised now anyway. So it, it doesn't really even matter probably anyway. I mean, they, they make such a big deal. I saw the Canes jerseys. And maybe, Dan, you could comment about what you saw with them today to just uh, digress for a minute. They're okay. Did you see those? I, I did, yeah. And given how boring the Canes jerseys have been over the recent years, you know, since they got rid of the stripes and everything, it was just plain red jerseys. It, it is an upgrade, but uh, I don't think they'll ever be able to top their originals. Yeah. Yeah, the, the Canes and uh, – well, they got to do something. They've had some really bad publicity <laughs> But we'll get into that a little bit later. I'm, I'm just going to finish up. When I first started, my favorite flyers were like all the French guys. That, that unlike Anthony's father, that was so neat. The other like basketball and football and baseball, they didn't really have these these French guys. Jean Guy Gendron. My favorite was Andre Lacroix. It was like their best player until Bob Clark came, and uh, Bill Lazouk and Serge Bernier. And Bernie Perron was French uh, Canadian, of course, um, as as we can tell to this day. And you know, I played street hockey, and we just played. We used to cut the tennis ball to take the bounce out of it. And then Milek came out with all their equipment. You would saw off a regular hockey stick, and just screw on the the blade. And back then, they they played with the black puck, as opposed to the orange ball. And the black puck, you could shoot it a lot better than the ball, but it would wear down. So it's almost like a little, it would be like this little mini pancake after a while. Yeah. And you couldn't stick handle it. And the and you, and you had these people with a blade that was like an inch thick and then this little mini puck. And it was ridiculous. And then they came out with the ball and some people are like, well, that's not real hockey. It doesn't have a, you know, but it, it, it it's not a puck, but you could shoot it and pass, especially pass it better. So we made the adjustment, and then Milik expanded to the air, well, the airflow sticks and all that stuff. I never got on skates. I I was just starting to learn how to ice skate, and and then we didn't, you know, we didn't have that in the family budget. But uh, obviously, I lived through the the cup teams in '74 and '75. And if you want to talk about Frankfurt and Cotman, I mean, the standard for what the celebration was was set by what the Flyers did. Because basketball wasn't a, as big deal then. It's certainly not in 67, even with Will. So when 2 million people came to the parade in, in 74, everybody was just really just taken aback. They couldn't believe it. And then, of course, they won again in 75. And I went to that parade. We were at JFK Stadium. And that, that was back in the days of uh, streakers and all this. And I remember... That's where the parade ended at JFK, and all the Flyers players are giving their speeches, like just like you see today. And they thought they compete, uh, could compete for the next ten years. And, you know, the guys feel invincible back then. But and of course, they had the lean years after '76. Bernie got hurt. I'm not going to take you through all of it, but to see the resurgence in in the '80s, to me, and my favorite player of all time was Tim Kerr who was really the most natural scorer I've, I've ever seen in Flyers uniform because he, he could score so many different ways. He didn't quite have the shot of somebody like Reggie Leach, but um, I loved Tim Kerr. could score with a wrist shot, a snap shot, excellent deflection, just um, anything anything like a combination of Knubel and uh, Braden Channel and uh, Hartnell. He, he was like all those guys, but better. And uh, until LeClaire came along, and LeClaire was obviously a great player. But, yeah, with, the Flyers unfortunately ran into uh, teams that were dynasties, like uh, the Islanders in 80. Yeah, that, was a, that was a real heartbreaker t to lose on some bad calls. But the Islanders were a better team. And, of course, they followed the Canadians and all that. And then running into the Edmonton teams. Although I love those. I love Mark Howe. And... 
Tim Kerr. And then, of course, they really struggled at the end of that era until they made the big Lindros deal. And I'd say, outside of winning the Cup, uh, my biggest thrill uh, as a fan was actually when Larry Bertuzzi came down with the decision uh, to award the Flyers Eric Lindros. And it's just for everything that that, uh, you know, entailed and what that meant. Because really, Eric Lindros was the greatest single talent that was homegrown by the Flyers. There was really nobody like him. They they acquired Pronger. They acquired Mark Howe. They had drafted Forsberg, but then they traded him. No, the, the greatest player in terms of pure talent the Flyers ever had was Eric Lindros, and we were going to get him, and we were certainly going to win a cup. Obviously, it didn't work out, as we know, but um, there was a great days, and I think Paul Hungren, hearkening back to what uh, Anthony was talking about, you know, with that lousy season that, that the Flyers had, Paul Hungren did a great job of putting together a team he kind of stumbled finishing the job to get them to a cup contention window. But it's it's really, it, and it, like Dan, like you were saying, up until the last like seven years, it's really been a great ride being a Flyers fan. This has really been, this last period has been very similar to like the early 90s era, right before, you know, the Farwell era, right before the Flyers got Lindros. And hopefully this is the beginning of the end of that with Chuck Fletcher uh, uh, on board and making a few more moves. Uh, any comments? No, I, I, I can comment uh, on a couple of little things, but probably because we're, we're both old. But <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I remember, remember you could buy those black pucks and then they came out with the orange ones. Yeah. And it had a black center and it had the three little balls in it, remember? Oh yeah, that was a little bit later. Yeah, they, they didn't that work was a out. Bit later. Well. That's one of my playing days. You were ten you were ago, but it was all my like stuff. All good all good memories. Yeah, yeah. That's what we've all been through as fans and, and everything. And we just decided to do this podcast a couple of years ago. Neither uh Chef or I are, are the writers that uh, Anthony and Dan are, so Let's turn toward a little bit of controversy. Uh, Anthony, I'm going to start with you. Frank Cervalli is on this uh, podcast. Now, Frank, of course, used to be a local beat writer for the Daily News before they kind of consolidated under the Inquirer banner. And, um, of course, he's been up with the TSN now for a few years up in Canada. And he was on Snow the Goalie. Uh, the podcast with Anthony Sanfilippo and Russ Joy. And he put it out there that he heard from one of uh, Kevin Hayes' buddies that as when the Flyers acquired him, he said, well, I'm not going to uh, go to the Flyers unless I'm overpaid. Which, and he, Frank said a lot of other things too that we'll talk about with regard to predictions and stuff. But that was quickly denied or there was some pushback from obviously a buddy of Kevin Hayes, Ryan Whitney, ex NHL player who said, that's funny because uh, I ran into uh, Hazy as he called him. And uh, he told me he was all fired up when he got traded to Philly and he was watching game seven, I guess the Stanley cup finals uh, with three buddies in Dorchester. Uh, Anthony, uh, your comments. You know, uh, I, for the most part, like and respect Frank Cervelli. Obviously, he's up here in Canada for TSN, and he does a lot of good work. But I really don't know what he was going for here because it's not so much what he said, but his whole tone during that interview slash podcast, he was just trying to kick dirt on the Flyers, and it was almost like he was throwing shade at the Flyers. And like, and I understand that like maybe he doesn't believe in them, and there's some of us here that feel that opinion as well, but it seemed like he was going out of his way to really just push them down. And even his comment of, oh, they were only going to stay, they were only going to sign with, uh, he was only going to sign with the Flyers if he was overpaid. Well, what player who hits the open market and doesn't give a team a hometown discount 
usually doesn't go to a team that's that doesn't overpay a little bit. Obviously, to keep him from going to market, he was going to overpay. So, I don't know. Frank was just kind of stating the obvious, but at the same time trying to kind of push the flyers down and critique the move. And in doing so, he indirectly insulted Kevin Hayes, I think, because in the same breath, he was saying that the Flyers aren't good enough and their additions were not nearly as impactful enough. So he was on what he, in the same breath, he was saying that the Flyers only got him because they gave him a horrible contract, but then was saying that Kevin Hayes isn't nearly worth that contract and only stayed here because he was greedy. So... Although I understand what Frank was trying to say, it just came off very bad, and he insulted not only the team, but the player as well. Yeah, I agree with that. It was almost like schadenfreude in advance, like taking pleasure in someone else's misery before anything ever played out. And and Dan, the, the other thing was, you know, I was listening to uh, our buddy Russ Cohen uh, on the, the Hockey Buzz cast in Eklund, and boy, they were, you know, they were really giving it to, to Frank because, you know, Eklund is one thing. Eklund's really good with interpersonal relationships. I'm not a big fan of, of his rumors and, and E5 and whatever, but he knows people and he's a genuine guy in that respect. And he was saying Frank had a reputation that players didn't want to say anything to him. And he burned a few bridges and Russ was basically calling BS on what he what he was saying, especially in light of Ryan Whitney's coming out and upon hearing that and tweeting what he did. Yeah, it, it was a very weird situation. I'm not entirely sure what Frank was trying to uh, to go after there. You know, I think Anthony um, put it in good context, but I, I'm just I don't know. I don't know what the end game is here. It doesn't make Frank look good, and uh, it doesn't make I don't know. This was a whole situation that was just dumb from start to finish. Yeah, you know, Chef, um, and the thing about F- Frank came off in that interview as a guy, like a guy who came home, he's with all his buddies that know him and accept him for who he is, good, bad, or ugly, and it was ugly. Like, he, you know, I think the expression is he was showing his ass during this interview, and it wasn't pretty. Yeah, I, it, it was like, uh, I'm going to flex my muscles and say something just because I can. And that's all it seemed to me. It was. It seemed like somebody was, just, it seemed like an action of somebody who was just trying, I don't want to say be relevant because he's out there a lot. And I, I, I don't, it's, it's hard to explain to me. It, it, it makes it uh, for shock value just to stir the pot maybe get some likes or some clicks or talking or something along those lines. That That's how I felt about it. I thought it was, it was unnecessary. Yeah. It was just very glib. It was almost, almost condescending in a way. Like, yeah. you know, I'm a national guy now. So, you know, and you want to know what all the people are saying. It's something in, in that vein, you know? Yeah. I, I'm just hoping, uh, Oh, well, obviously, there's there was a lot of pushback and all that. I'm just hoping that the, you know, people like fans don't sit there and go, "Oh, well, I hate Kevin Hayes now, and he hasn't even played a game." I, I hate this person because I, I just think that it, you take a wait and see approach. If any any bit of that is going to be true, it would have trickled out even further by now, or somebody would have said something else, to either confirm it or, "Oh, yeah, I heard that too," and then. Uh, but it's it's this isn't the case. I just think it was somebody just trying to to be the big kid on the playground. I, yeah, I, yeah, I, I think so. I, I I mean, there's enough media spin right now. I think people are really starting to catch on. You know, everybody, yeah. everybody's got a narrative these days, and you get you got to do your own investigation about stuff beyond uh, the world of sports, whatever. But uh, Dan, it, it it begs the question now: the Flyers used to be one of those teams that were considered a premier destination. I've experienced this. Things are different now. But it, it, the impression is left that the Flyers like had to overpay or there's no way Kevin Hayes would consider coming here because the, the, these aren't your these aren't Ed Snyder's Flyers anymore. What what do you think about that? 
it, you know, I think it's in modern day, it's so hard to tell. You know, there's so many rumors out there. And, and pretty much ever since they acquired his rights, there have been rumors that Kevin Hayes didn't want to sign or he wanted to go back to New York. He wanted to go back to Chicago. You know, he wasn't happy that Elaine Vigneault was here or whatever. You know, it, these aren't the days of, you know, Ed Snyder and his deep pockets and him willing to do anything to build a competitive team here. You know, it's not like that anymore. And after five years of nothing under Ron Hextall, I, I could see where the reputation is damaged. But I, I don't, unless you're a team like Tampa or Toronto or Boston, you know, th that is a legitimate superstar team that could compete at any time at any caliber. I don't think there is a, you know, a destination city anymore. And, you know, ever since the salary cap, I think that's the case. And I just think that this has been a rough season. It's been a, and it goes back to the Flyers fans in general, you know, being quote unquote negative, you know, is Kevin Hayes here? Is he not here? Is he the right move? Is, is it going to work? Is he being overpaid? Yeah, I just think that the fans are grasping for straws at anything right now. And in a summer where we were led to believe that they would go after, you know, Panarin or Bobrovsky or whatever, go for a bigger name. I think the fact that Kevin Hayes, who is a good player, but not quite there. I think that he has just been the whipping boy this summer. And uh, hopefully he goes out there when the season starts and uh, shuts up some of the critics. Yeah, we can hope so. Uh, but, you know, Chef, the other thing is, I think you could mark the end of the Flyers' era of relevance when they failed to get that offer sheet signed with Weber. And mm. when they couldn't get him because Nashville match, it was obvious that um, he wanted to be here. That, that was especially the way the offer was structured. And that seemed to do a little damage to Holmgren throughout the league. And the Flyers, of course, were never able to, what was that, 2012 they tried doing yep. that? And that was Ooh, just when Holmgren little... was really, of course, obviously, you're putting out an offer sheet. And, and the way that whole thing was structured, there was obvious uh, desperation for Shea Weber to come here. And when they didn't get that, and the team declined, and Hextall had to come here. And remake yeah. everything. And then the, that combined with Ed Snyder's passing. I do think there, there is something to the Flyers not being a premier destination anymore. They're not like New York. They don't have the location. Or they're not like a perennial cup contender. Right. And haven't been for a while. So what is compelling other than, well, they're always been a solid franchise, you know, and this and that. I, I think there, there is a little bit of bloom off the rose until the Flyers earn the right to be considered a premier destination by what they do out on the ice. Yeah. I mean, Dan was spot on. He said the, the first nail in the coffin was the salary cap. And I think that up until that point, we, we all, we you know, maybe the younger guys don't remember so much, but... I don't think Ed Snyder at any point in his life said, no, I, I, I don't think I, I would pay that for that great of a player. He was willing to throw money at anything, really. I mean, so I, that was the first nail when it was, you know, when the salary cap hit and he couldn't flex his financial muscles. Like I, I, I think he, he did in the past. That was one of them Two was obviously his passing. Uh, you know, he was, he was, he was a, I don't want to say dad, but he was the dad of the Flyers. They're all in this area. Yeah, but I mean, let, let me let me, uh, let me just jump in there because I mean, they did win though. That's the thing. I mean, he, yeah, a lot they, of them did win. Yeah, yeah, and the eighties teams went to a couple cups, and everybody understood they were beaten by you know legendary yeah. Edmonton clubs or among the best of all time. But the thing is though, even when the cap era hit, I mean, the Flyers got what Forsberg, Rafferty. Hatcher, that was right after the cup, right? And then when they fell apart, they were still able to get Briere. They made that trade that Team Manning and Hartnell were still were had to agree to contracts, and they overpaid. But still, that that's just even if the Flyers had done a teardown, I, I really think they would have had to severely overpay. I, I I do think the combination of factors, all of which have been mentioned, but it's different even than it was even when it. Like uh, 2012, I mm -hmm. think really that was a, that was a turning point. That's just 
in yeah. my thinking. And I do think there's an image problem, uh, Anthony, and, and I guess you're not as connected with this. There's a problem with this corporate ownership and some of the relationship they have with the season ticket holders. People are not happy. They don't have the personal touch that Ed Snyder and his people and his acolytes had. So the Flyers have some challenges on many different levels as an organization. Well, yeah, you, you know, going from, you know, a, a very, not private owner, but like a very public owner, I think that's the better word, where like he was very involved and hands-on and, you know, like he was very personable to going to full-on corporate, it is a bit of a change. You know, you can see the difference between owners right here in Montreal like a guy like Jeff Molson, who's a similar guy to Ed Schneider. He's the team president. He's hands-on. He's personable with the crowd, uh, with the uh, with the fans and the media. I've been there as a uh, as a media member. But then you look down the highway at the Toronto Maple Leafs, and they're owned by a big corporation known as Rogers, uh, which is very similar to Comcast, like the Flyers. So yeah, I I think that there are a lot of hurdles to come, especially given the fact of all the years of Ed Schneider being at the helm of the Flyers. But, you know, I, I also think Ron Hextel had a lot to do with this. From all accounts that I've kind of read into is that he wanted to change the quote, I think uh, Michael Russo, I think that's his name, of The Athletic put it into context. He wanted to get rid of the country club vibe and, yeah. you know, box out some of those uh, alumni and, you know, like kind of just make it more of a, I don't know, like a serious at atmosphere. But, yeah, I think it's, you know, coming off of the – you know, Wild West days of Clark and then Holmgren and then going to Ron Hextall where everyone was excited, but then he kind of turned it into just this serious thing and he was a micromanager. The Flyers have a lot of work to do here. And that's why I think kind of like what Dan said, when people are just finding anything to complain about, it's with some good reason and it clouds the judgment as to why people can't see the positives because they're just so fed up with it. Yeah, no, I, I could see that. And, gents, you know, it, it is getting a little bit later, but I do want to cover a couple other things. So, Dan, let me start with you. Uh, some, uh, like at the uh, Pro Hockey Talk and The Athletic, think that the Flyers are treading water. They sound a lot more like uh, Frank Cervalli did, like we were talking about. And then you have people like Dave Reed, ex-player, he's a commentator now at NHL Network, and uh, the Hockey News picked the Flyers to finish third in the Metro Division. Uh, you know, so it's a wide disparity of opinion of what the Flyers are. Locally, both Bill Meltzer and Jason Martinez confess, they're not sure what the Flyers are. They, they have to see him play. And I went out on record, because I'm the one that runs the site, so I'm guilty. You have, you have complaints to run them through Isaiah. But uh, on the OMB podcast Twitter account, I'm on record as saying the Flyers will need to make a major trade to salvage their play playoff hopes because they have so many ifs that one of them's bound to not come through. Whether they need a backup goaltender better than Brian Elliott, or um, they need more than that because Carter Hart wasn't quite ready after only 31 games. They needed a better defenseman. They need more scoring or meet more guys that can play at tough minutes. Whatever it is, the Flyers are going to need a little bit more. What is your take now that you've had a little more time to take in, you know, to form your opinion about where they're at? Uh, I think you pretty much nailed it. There's a lot of what ifs on this team. And the chances of them all lining up and being perfect and, and working themselves out, I don't think are going to happen. And I've noticed this with the fans, you know, some of the more optimistic fans, you know, they they think everything's going to work. You know, hey, this is going to be good and the goaltending is going to hold and Niskanen and Braun are going to play like they did when they were 25 and everything's going to be fine. You know, and I just don't think that's the case, um, especially if Provorov holds out. I, I think they're going to learn right quick that this just is not ready for that, that you know, Niskanen and Braun just aren't going to make it. But I, they didn't get a backup goaltender other than Brian Elliott, and I think that's going to bite them sooner or later. 
you know, after we just saw them run through eight goaltenders last season, I think it's only a matter of time before one of the other gets hurt. And then you're all of a sudden dealing with Alex Lyon again. And that's a disaster. And, you know, there's a lot of what ifs on the forwards as well. You know, is Nolan Patrick going to take the next step? Is Konechny going to break out? Is Lindblom going to continue? You know, it, can Van Riemsdyk be a good player all season and not just the last month? You know, Voracek and Drew, all these questions. And there's just so many... I, I, the Flyers are going to be better than they were last year because, quite frankly, it's very difficult to be worse than they were last year. But I don't know where they finish yet. You know, the Metro Division is a very tough division. The Eastern Conference in general is pretty tough. And uh, I just – they're going to be better, but I'm not sold on them being a bona fide playoff team just yet. Yeah. Yeah, I was listening to Bill Meltzer on the High and Wide uh, podcast. Your buddy Angry Jim is a good guy. Uh, check out his podcast, uh, High and Wide Radio. Um, yeah, as Chef, it, Bill was saying something like it, he doubts whether the Metro is actually better this year. He thinks, yeah, New Jersey and the Rangers are better, but some of the other teams have stepped back a little bit. Washington's still good, but they're not as good as they were a couple of years ago. Pittsburgh took some hits. Columbus took some hits. Uh, Carolina should be a good team, but there's some questions whether... Justin Williams is, is going to even return. Still questions in goal. But, I mean, for me, I, I'm with Dan in that I think the Flyers are better. But how much better? And will it be good enough? It's funny because I actually listened to that podcast today. I listened to several podcasts. I had like a little honey-to-do list. So I just put it in, put in my earpiece, and started listening today. And the one thing that caught me true. And it was true. He said, he, he said also, too, on paper, they're better. And I think that was a, a very telling, telling, telling remark about that is, you know, we could say on paper, they're good all they want, but they still have to play games. And I think he's true in the, in the respect that two other teams got better, two other teams stayed the same and two other teams are worse, slightly worse. So any influx of what could happen in this, in this, uh, in this division con conference, you know, the whole thing, I, I think it's, I think too many teams have jumbled and I'm not even going to try to guess at this point. I just think it's safe to say that on paper, yes, they are better than they, what they were last year. I think they have to, now they have to turn around the flyer flint fans out there and prove that they are better by winning hockey games. Yeah, I don't think there's any question. I I know, uh, Anthony, you have been more sanguine on the Flyers. You think um, probably along the same lines as the Flyers do. They, they, they looked at their goals against, and that became job one for uh, Chuck Fletcher. If you wanted to you know, spit out a coherent vision of what the Flyers are trying to do. That seems to be what they're looking at. Maybe the model was the Islanders and the way they were able to reduce their goals against by 100. You know, I, I think it's because over these last seven horrible years, I've said that the biggest problem has been the depth. They've had good star players, especially at forward, but they've had very limited supporting cast. And in turn, a lot of their best players had to eat hard minutes. And I think the same could be said on defense. You know, like, I look at guys like Ivan Provorov, okay, and that I saw a comparison today on, I think it was on Hockey Buzz, between him and Zach Warinsky. And everyone's saying, well, Warinsky's better. Well, Warinsky's been playing with Seth Jones. Look at a guy like Aaron Eckblad. He played the first couple of years with Brian Campbell, and now he's playing with Keith Yandel. You know, the, the, where I'm going with this is that I think the Flyers' biggest need was to insulate their star players with guys who could support them adequately. And over ever since Ron Hextall took over and he got rid of guys like Scott Hartnell and Mark Strike got up there in age and Kimo Timnan wasn't around anymore and Braden Coburn moved on and Nicholas Grossman got traded. I'm not saying these are guys that moved the needle, but they were good insulating players and it resulted in a lot of the flyers top end guys having to do hard heavy defensive minutes like you just said so they got guys to help in that respect now am i sold on the goaltending 
No, because I do think that they could have done a hell of a lot better than Brian Elliott. Do am I sold on you know the forward depth? I think the, there stands to be a bit of a concern there. You know, you are still putting a lot of faith in some young guys. But I think all in all, they addressed a need, and the need was to beef up their defense and beef up their depth. In the NHL today, you, you can't have your top-end players starting a bunch of shifts in the defensive zone. And that's what happened with guys like Giroux and Couturier, and on defense, guys like Ivan Provorov and Travis Sandheim. I really like these moves. I'm more optimistic than most. I'm not saying that they're going to be challenging for a cup in June of uh, 2020, but I think that there's enough reason to be positive to at least maybe fathom the idea that they are a bona fide playoff team. Yeah, they're so dependent on Carter Hart, though. That's the thing. That really bugs me that they didn't go out and get a better alternative and that it's just, I have a feeling that it's really going to burn them, but uh, we'll, we'll have to see. Uh, that is probably my biggest beef with uh, Chuck Fletcher. That they, they put that much. Yeah, they need 50 games of like at least nine, 15 goaltending from Carter Hart, and if they don't get it, I think they are S O L. But uh, Anthony, real fast here, people are freaking out because Bill Meltzer had a series about candidates for the third line right wing spot, and he talked about the rookies. He talked about current vets and maybe some of the new vets who could be candidates for that spot. And he predicted that when it's all said and done, the kids wouldn't be ready and that uh, Tyler Pitlick would actually be the guy that nails down that spot. And he seemed to back it up with some tweets that indicating how important that that particular player was at, at different junctures for the stars. Uh, let's say you. Well, I think that he got a lot of backlash because people just, you know, they don't know who the hell Tyler Pitlick is. And I think I saw some comparisons today to him of Dale Weiss. If if I'm guessing, I think Scott Lawton comes out with that job. I'm being overly cautious with my expectations for guys like Frost and Faraby. Maybe that's just a, project, a product of Ron Hextall force-feeding us, you know, potential of 20 year olds for the last four years yeah. so i'm just like I, I won't expect them to be on the roster until they actually do it so when i look at the roster in front of me who can make that jump to the third line pitlick raffle or scott lawton and I, I saw scott lawton last year on the wing i really liked him on the third line at one point with patrick and simmons i think as of right now that's the best bet. I think he could help a guy like Nolan Patrick in the defensive zone. I like his speed. Maybe Pitlick could bring a defensive and more physical presence. He is a bigger guy than Lawton. And as you mentioned, there were some uh, tweets from some very reliable uh, um, beat writers down in Dallas and some quotes from then head coach Ken Hitchcock saying that he formed a very good third line with Roddick Fox. Uh, the third name is escaping me. But I, if I were a betting man right now, I think when all said and done, it's going to be Scott Lawton on that third line. But I don't necessarily think that it will be, let's say, a Patrick Lindblom Lawton third line. I think that there will be a lot of moving parts there. But I think Lawton will be the guy to round out that top nine, unless a guy like Frost or Ferry completely blows off the doors in training camp. Yeah. Uh, and Dan, you know, I think Lawton is going to be the guy, too, because a couple of reasons. Uh, if it's not, to me, I think the rookie who looks like he profiles best there would actually be uh, German Rupsov. And because of his two-way play, his speed, his IQ, and Patrick needs to play with uh, someone who has some kind of defensive awareness, uh, in my humble opinion. And if it's not him, Scott Lawton started in the defensive zone like 62 or 63% of the time, still got 12 goals. So I'm kind of in agreement with Anthony there. What say you? Yeah, I agree. I think Lawton should be the guy. Um, you know, he was snake bitten for a vast majority of the season last year. And if he can find that scoring touch, I mean, he could be, you know, a, a genuinely one of the best bottom six guys in the league. Uh, if, you know, if he can start scoring, you know, maybe even 20 goals, 15, 20 goals a year to go pair that with his defensive game. I mean, that's a, that would be huge for the third line and, you know, to continue the efforts of the game of somebody like uh, Nolan Patrick. 
Yeah, I mean, his, some of his metrics are kind of cratering earlier in the year, but then I look at that zone start percentage and the amount of offense he got, and I think it was practically all five on five. So I, I give him a little bit bit of a break. But uh, and Chef, moving along, I just want to ask you, would you say that looking at the lineup right now, what the Flyers did have to make a trade, that right now it looks as if uh, Shane Gostas Bear would be the number one trade chip? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I said it before, and I think you kind of you sh- you shut me down thinking it was way too early to be thinking about that. But as as this plays out, and I, I think he's probably the best tool and in, in your drawer right now. I think he, he can fetch you the best return of what's out there. Yeah, yeah. I I think uh, it, depending on what what's going on with Provorov. Uh, that'll shake out, and I think he will be, and it will be very interesting, uh, Dan, going back to you, to see, I know you have a, we, we kind of joke about it with uh, Sam Moran and, and Robert Haig, but, you know, with only, what was it, 22 games for Phil Myers, NHL experience, the Flyers have to be real careful with who the partner is with this player, and I'm wondering if the Flyers go with option C and, and, and make a trade, and trade one of these young guys to get a better, steadier partner. Maybe trade a guy like Haig for someone who's better, maybe. Uh, a little older, that's okay, because Sam Moran is, is going to be staying up here. And that would work better for the Flyers, maybe. Yeah, and I think that's kind of the biggest issue, is there are just a lot of bodies back there. You know, Sanheim is great, Provorov is great, but for all we know, he may hold out for at least part of the season. And I think they're going to rely heavily on Niskanen and Braun, and we're not entirely sure if they can rebound to what they used to be. And, you know, obviously Sam Moran, the greatest defenseman of all time, you can put him in there, but he just doesn't have the experience yet. Myers doesn't have the experience yet. So the you can move him around. I don't know what really happens here. I guess really this all depends on where Ivan Provorov is when the season starts. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I got to remind everybody, no matter what you see in camp, it's, it's really fool's gold. We saw this with Vorobiev, and I'm not just trying to put the knock on him, but these, you're talking about guys that are like half the team is an AHL, play, uh, AHL players. And if they're NHL players, they're not given full effort. And it, it, there are different stages of the season where it ramps up in intensity. So I prefer, and anybody can feel that to jump in on this, I just prefer even Rupsov, who has some pro experience. What did he play, 14 games last year or something like that? I just think it would be better. These are not like transcendent talents that can come right into the league. If they get just like about 30 or 40 games at least, you know, they got – they have to learn how to be a pro. Again, hearkening back to what Bill Meltzer said, you know, they got to learn how to pay their bills and 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 become adults and professionals. And I think even that brief period of time for Carter Hart, when he was screwing up in the AHL and he was caught behind the net making all kinds of silly mistakes, that really helped him. So when they did yeah. call on him, it, it makes a difference. Like, let's you know, I know they want to get off to a fast start, and maybe a guy can flash for a little bit, but let's not also forget the nine games and the sliding, the entry-level contract. You put it all together, if the Flyers can live for about 40 games with Scott Lawton on that right wing, and maybe yeah. Nick Obekubel, and maybe Pitlick can play center or what have you on the fourth line, if you really want to solidify those three, you know, pack those top three lines, it's okay. And then yep. maybe at that point, one of the kids will emerge and it'll naturally it'll flow like it did for Goss Despair, like it did for Carter Hart. And, and I think it'll make a lot more sense. I, I, kind of, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly there. I, as much as I joke about uh, Radcliffe making the team, oh, I, 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 it's all a joke. It, I hope that people realize that I wasn't serious. Uh I was, I only made that point because he's a big boy. He's probably one of the guys that's fu- purely physically ready to play in the NHL. But uh, if if we can just let them sit for, like you said, 20, 25, 30 games, look, there'll be plenty of times when they'll be called upon this season because season has, you know, we've seen it 
last year a lot and even more the year before. Yeah, there's injuries all the oh, time. Yeah, injuries. And if you're a goalie, you got a hell of a great chance of playing for the Philadelphia Flyers in the last couple of years. I mean, the odds are like, what, 10%? <laughs> so, I mean, like, you you can get here. You don't have to force it. Let, let stuff come naturally. You get 25, 30 games, 35, 40 games under your belt. You have that confidence down at the AHL level. HL level and they come up here and actually make a difference when you're here. Yeah, none of this. I, I that's one thing I definitely agree with Hextall. Yo yoing these guys doesn't really help. We people were freaking out when Sandheim had to go back down, and he did have to go back down. People t- yeah. were in denial to this day. It did help him, and he got his game straightened out. So let's try to avoid that if we can. But, uh, gents, before he we wasn't wrap- good last year, but uh, good for what they did to Goodburn. <laughs> up and down. He was on. A, he was in the car more. Oh, yes, you mean like oh, right Goldburn, Ty, Tyrell Goldburn, Goldburn, Goldburn Tyler Goldburn. Yeah, he yeah. was. He was. Yeah. He was back and forth so many times, he, and he never played. And that's like the most horrible thing. You, you're you, you're in a car when you can be on the ice driving back and forth between Lehigh and, and Philadelphia. It's ridiculous. I mean, Tyrell Goldburn, the panacea for for. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> for Ron Hextall. But you know what? I don't care if you yo-yo uh, Tyrell Goldborn. I mean, he's just not, you know, he's he's a quad A player not. at best. And now, I mean, I'm talking about a good player, a guy. You, no, you, I know, I know, I, I, I know, but still, he should have gotten his easy pass money back at least. Yeah, well, you know, maybe he's a better driver than he used to be because <laughs> of the experience. What what a clown show. That That's when you knew Hextall had no answers and it was like, it was like coming up with the funky looking Joker every time, but anyway. So the Flyers have. Um, let me see. They their season kind of begins with the rookie game on Wednesday, uh, September 11th versus the Islanders, and then you know the the squad comes in after that, and they, and they practice and all that, and they have their first exhibition game on September the 16th again versus the Islanders, and they're also featured on national TV 20 times. So that'll be exciting. We'll talk more in our next show about you know they're opening up the what opening up in the Czech in the Czech Republic, right? Yep. Yeah. So that would be interesting. So um, one last thing, God, it, you know, it seems like there's off season. There's nothing to talk about, and then it, God, there's so much to talk about. But uh, one last thing, the, the more more prospect rankings came out. You should check them out on our, on our timeline. Uh, Steve Corianos. Uh, Anthony, I don't know how familiar with him, uh, with him you are from the sporting news. He used to be an independent. Uh, no charge. If you check our timeline and look for Steve Corianos, he gives you his um, prospect rankings. They're ranked ninth by the sporting news and fifth by the elite prospects. And I think those are rankings by our buddy uh, Russ Cohen with a little bit of help fr- from uh, our last guest, uh, in our prior show, Anthony Mingioni. Uh, safe to say, Anthony, the Flyers still have a bevy of prospects, and if they lose a couple veterans over the next couple years, they're still in good shape. Yeah, well, you know, Dan and I have joked about it on Brotherly Pod that they have enough B plus level prospects to fill out two teams. And that's why when uh, people were kind of having, you know, meltdowns about the Flyers training a fifth round pick to acquire Hayes or yeah. throw an extra second or third to get Braun, like, you know, relax. It's okay. They've drafted nine times in the first round since 2015. Throw in, you know, I don't think Hextall traded a draft pick in uh, in a trade until they made that trade for um, Mrazic. So they're, they're okay on prospects. You know, they're more than okay. And there's no doubt that they have enough the, enough prospects to last them, I would say, for at least the next half a decade. Uh, I just think now, maybe I'm just getting a bit impatient because it's been, what, five years that we've been promised all this hype. But I, I want them to show it, you know. And I think maybe what happened with Vorobiev last year kind of left a bad taste in my mouth. But to get back on track, the, the potential's there. They have a, a few blue chip guys, you know, Frost, Farabee. I really like this Cam York kid, and I'm liking that pick more and more. But they have to translate it here. And I think that they're well set up. That I think the biggest thing here is that now Fletcher, if maybe midseason, he has to part with a, 
prospect with potential or a decently high level draft pick, it's not the end of the world. Yeah. Because they are so well set up and they don't have to worry about the days of, let's say, Paul Holmgren, where you had to part with something that, you know, came from a waste baron. Exactly. I mean, they, if they, look, they have to make the playoffs this year. And I think I'm going to stick with our prediction that they will have to expend uh, an asset and maybe trade one of the prospects. Just looking at elite prospects and the aforementioned article by Russ, I just what, for people that don't pay, I just want to give you the rundown of the top 10. The Flyers are ranked the fifth overall uh, prospect pool in the entire league by uh, EP rink side uh, elite prospects, and that's impressive. That's a very good prospect site. Uh, so you don't only have to pay for this. So I want to thank Russ in advance for giving away his list. But, of course, there's lots of information. Number one, he has uh, Joel Faraby, followed by Morgan Frost. Number three is Cam York. Isaac Ratcliffe, the goaltender from Sweden, Samuel Ersan, is number five. Followed, uh, number six is Bobby Brink. So, obviously, a couple additions just in the past draft, which is uh, excellent. Bobby Brink is an um, interesting player, and I think we're going to be watching him in comparison with Cole Caulfield for uh, many years, uh, unfair as that may be. Number seven, and, and, and Russ is a little unique here, Ronnie Adderd from Tri-City. He's an overager, but uh, Russ really likes him, maybe more than some of the others. Number eight, Felix Sandstrom. Number nine, German Rupsov. And number 10, also a little higher than um, some others, Noah Cates from the University of Minnesota Duluth. And that rounds out the top 10. And I'll just give you a couple more. Uh, Tanner Lezinski, Jay O'Brien, Wade Allison, Adam Yenning, definitely rank, ranks him higher than some others, and Wyatt Wiley. So there you go, Dan. Uh, the Flyers uh, uh, definitely have some players there that could be moved if need be, if they, if they have to make the trade that we anticipate they probably have will have to make. Yep, whether it's injury or just you're, uh, you know, trying to squeeze into the playoffs at the trade deadline. They have plenty of uh, people there to part with what, that, you know, are not named Frost or Farabee. So there's uh, plenty of potential there, plenty of moves, and uh, hopefully they don't need to address any major holes and this team works out fine, but uh, have a feeling somewhere along the line something's going to fall apart. Yep, and I think the guy that most people are going to ask for, that the Flyers might be willing to treat, would be, uh, sorry, Chef, uh, Isaac Ratcliffe. He's a unique skill set. There's not a lot of guys like him. I think the Flyers could get quite a haul. I'm not saying I'm looking forward to that, but just saying. I know, I know. I know he's trade bait right now, but I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll still follow him even if he gets traded. Yeah. Him, him and Moran are going to get packaged in a deal to somewhere, and it's gonna, you're going to hear a collective cry coming from the OMB puck sound room. Uh, well, I mean, hey. But, Moran's but, not going anywhere. He's the greatest of all time. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so now we've entered the Twilight Zone portion of the show. Okay. Last thing. <laughs> uh, uh, Anthony, obviously working for the uh, fourthperiod.com in touch with DB and Dave Peñota when he pops up occasionally. Uh, are there any rumors right now, and, and specifically, like we were talking before the show, are there any teams – that could pull their version of a, like a boy check Letty late ad, big surprise because with the RFA situation so unique this year, the two teams are going to have to let go of some players. And I'm thinking there are some teams that could kind of swoop in like a hawk and get better real fast. Well, well, things are very quiet right now. Just to kind of put it in perspective, it's been con not confirmed, but it's been rumored that Sakic of the Avalanche and Miko Rontanen's camp haven't talked in weeks. So that's kind of like where the market is right now. One team I'll keep big tabs on are the Winnipeg Jets. They are headed for a big-time cap crunch with Kyle Connor and Patrick Laine. Uh, they, they have chosen Connor as priority, he, and they are listening and will continue to listen on Patrick Line. There's been a rift between them. It seems like Line would welcome a trade anywhere else. Um, so I would keep tabs on the Winnipeg Jets. 
And as for RFAs who are most likely to go first, I think the three who will go first are Braden Point, Brock Besser, and Matthew Kachuk in no particular order. Uh, expect uh, Point's AAV to come in around the $9 million mark, and Kachuk and Besser would probably be more around 7 to 8 Obviously, Brad Tree Living, the general manager of the Calgary Flames, won't want to go too much higher than Johnny Goudreau, who is currently the highest paid forward on the um, Calgary Flames when dealing with Matthew Kachuk. In terms of teams that could maybe swoop in to try and take advantage of, say, a team like the Winnipeg Jets, you know, you know, all bets are off here. I think we've seen it in years past where a team such as the San Jose Sharks that you would think would be the last team to go after a big-time player like Eric Carlson always find a way. So I don't think that there's any concrete or obvious teams that could go down that route and look for a steal. Obviously, like you mentioned, the Jackets may be looking for some help in the short term. But yeah, I, uh, uh, I think it's going to be very interesting surrounding these RFAs and um, mo- more specifically the Winnipeg Jets. Hmm. Yeah, I, I definitely think... Um... The Blue Jackets, because their general manager, I think, is skilled all around that and very good at his job, could be one of those teams. That's just pure speculation. I don't have it, the information like Anthony gets through TFP. So that's just to let you know there's a divide between what I'm saying and what Anthony is saying through his sources uh, at TFP. And, of course, you heard the last thing uh, about Marner having contacted a team in Zurich, Switzerland, as an alternative while the uh, negotiations are going on. Any updates on that? Uh, I think that's more of just a a bargaining chip right now. They're just playing games. Posturing? Pardon me? Posturing? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So the problem is is that it's kind of been well documented that Mitch Marner wants to stay in Toronto. You know, he's a hometown kid and everything. So that has kind of backed him into a corner And whether he likes it or not, or whether fans like it or not, the the Leafs drew a line in the sand. And they said, you know, we're going all in with guys like Tavares and Matthews. And that's the way it is. I I don't really like how the Leafs have handled it. You know, Brendan Shanahan has taken over talks now. Kyle Dubas isn't running that uh, that negotiation anymore. You know, Brendan Shanahan stepped in and nixed a deal. And... Uh, I don't know where Marner's camp is heading with this. I know they want Austin Matthews money. I don't think he'll get it, nor do I think he's worth it. But eventually it's going to come to a head here, and I think he's going to have to settle on $10 million because I I think there's no – I don't think he's going to get more than that from the Maple Leafs. Gotcha. Last question. I'm going to give you three UFAs. Uh, Tell me – What's is Patrick Marlowe going back to San Jose or anywhere in the NHL? Or is he going to have to uh, either retire or get a PTO? Uh, if he does come back, it will be for the San Jose Sharks. I just don't know if there's mutual interest there. There's been conflicting reports. It seemed like it was a done deal. But now it seems as though the Sharks may want to go in a different direction. All I can tell you is I'd be extremely, extremely shocked if he comes back to a team not named the San Jose Sharks. Okay. Joe Thornton, no, that's that's going to be more or less already been a handshake deal. Yeah, Kevin Kurz of The Athletic more or less said that it's not a matter of if, but rather when Thornton will re-up with the Sharks. Okay. Justin Williams coming back, or is he still contemplating retirement? Uh, same boat uh, as the um, as Patrick Marlowe. It's you know he he won't come back, and I have that on good authority for any other team but Carolina. He you know he put his roots down in Carolina in terms of his personal life. I think that it's just uh, whether or not the owner Tom Dundon, who we know is notoriously stingy, is willing to pay up for his captain services. But if he does come back, it will be with the Carolina Hurricanes. Okay. Uh, we got to get out of here. It's been a real long show. I hope you, I hope you guys really enjoyed it. Uh, Dan, uh, where can people uh, find you on Twitter and with Brotherly uh, National Puck and Pod? 
Yeah, you can find me at Dan the Flyer Fan, find the site at Brotherly Puck, at Brotherly underscore pod, at National Puck, and at National Pod Net. Season two of Brotherly Pod, Angry Negative Show. Uh, we'll be back uh, the first week of September, I believe, Wednesday. I believe that's the fourth. Check out brotherlypuck.com. Anthony and I co authored a piece, the Flyers 2010 All Decade Team. So check that out from page of brotherlypuck.com. Links are on the Twitter page. Uh, yeah, we, we were going to talk about that. Just, just, it's, <laughs> we just couldn't get to it. Check out. That at Brotherly Puck, the old decade team is a good article. I recommend it very highly. Um, Anthony, uh, the fourth period at dot com. Uh, give us your contact info for the people to know. You can find my work at the fourth period. Check out the Twitter page at TFP and my personal handle at Adamarco25. We should be fully back up and running after Labor Day. Fantastic. Sh- chef, uh, you are the head chef at Steam Pub. Uh, where else, what, what else can you tell the folks? Yeah, you can come uh, see me there at 606 Second Street Pike, Southampton, PA. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter, Chef to Left B. Uh, chef to Left B on Instagram as well, Steam Pub and Instagram. All kinds, of, you can see the food we make. We send out specials every week. And uh, yeah, oh yeah, I tweet flyer stuff too. Oh yeah, watch out, watch out. And, of course, I'm Isaiah. Uh, I can be found on Twitter at uh, I-S-A-I-A-H underscore 520. Don't forget the underscore at Isaiah underscore 520. And, of course, the OMB podcast is on so many formats. Uh, we're doing a, a, a little Twitter poll about which ones maybe are vital for you. We're getting a lot of Spotify. iTunes is the king. If you could rate and subscribe. And uh, don't forget, we also have a YouTube channel. Just put in OMB podcast, uh, YouTube and you'll find our show on it's it's an audio, audio only but some people really like YouTube if you could rate and subscribe at your favorite platform we'd really appreciate it and of course on Twitter we're at at OMB Puck at OMB Puck and with that well we'll be back in uh, oh, a few weeks uh, and I'm sure there'll be uh, hopefully some more news some signings and with that everybody uh, take care <laughs>